Welcome to the European Year of Youth. This is a year of hope, a year dedicated to our young people. One that brings new opportunities, new connections, new friendships. A year to speak, to listen and to be heard, to participate and to engage. The young are those that can shape the future of Europe. We need to listen to you, our young Europeans, because you are the ones who can change our perception of what is possible. You are the spirit of Europe's next generation. Dear young people, this is your year. Be bold, be ambitious, think out of the box, and most of all, enjoy. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tim Hayes, and I'm head of communication at the European Commission representation in Ireland. Uh, and I'm monitoring this event this morning. I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your participation. The event is hosted by the European Commission representation in collaboration with the European Movement. 2022 is the year dedicated to all young Europeans. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen declared in her State of the Union address last September that Europe needs all of its youth. So this is why the Commission proposed to make 2022 the European Year of Youth, strongly supported by the European Parliament and by the Council. I don't need to tell you, but that for the last two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impact, impacted young people's education, work, their social situation, their mental health, and of course, their well-being in general. Now that we're emerging from the pandemic, it's time to support the young generations. The European Year of Youth 2022 aims to make a difference in young people's lives. The intention is to showcase and bolster the efforts of the European Union, the member states, regional and local authorities, and to empower and engage with young people. The idea is to raise awareness among youth about the European Union so that young people should get a better understanding of what the European Union is doing for them, not only in the context of green and digital transitions, but also in terms of the various opportunities it offers to live, to work, to learn, to thrive, and to make friends right across the European Union. So we deliver programs such as the Erasmus Plus program, the European Solidarity Corps, the Marie Curie Fellowships and the Youth Action Plan in EU External Action to attribute special attention to youth, just to mention a few of our programmes. Now is the time to encourage young people, especially those young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, to acquire relevant knowledge, experience and skills to become active and engaged EU citizens. It's really vital that young people participate in shaping Europe's future because they are Europe's future. Europe needs the vision, engagement, and participation of all young people to build a better future. And Europe needs to give young people opportunities for the future, a future that is greener, more digital, and more inclusive. The EU offers many opportunities for young people, and I strongly encourage you all to look up the initiatives on the European Youth Portal. Choose those that fit your profile and take part in mobility projects and volunteering. Apply for travel passes or participate in the Youth Dialogue. The European Youth Portal is a communication hub for the year, and there is also a page dedicated to the European Youth Year of Youth there. So for today's event, we have a great lineup on the panel, and I'm delighted to welcome Member of the European Parliament, Maria Walsh, the Executive Director of Leargas, Lorraine Gilligan, and the founder of the Digital Youth Council, Harry McCann. I'd also like to invite the audience to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag European Year of Youth. When tweeting, please also use the handles at EU Ireland, that's EU R-I-R-E-L-A-N-D, and E-M-I Ireland. Questions can also be submitted via the EMI Live Event Centre or posted to the following email address, events at europeanmovement.ie. That's events at europeanmovement.ie. And you can see that address at the bottom of the screen. I'm now delighted to introduce our first speaker, Maria Walsh, MEP for the Midlands Northwest. 
Marie has been a member of the European Parliament for Fine Gael since 2019. Marie sits on three European Parliament committees, Empel, Cult and Libe. She's a member of the European People's Party in the European Parliament. She's been an active advocate and campaigner for diversity and social inclusion for many years. She's a consistent champion for mental health issues and always takes stances on policy and legislation that align with her values of inclusion, equality and respect. Maria, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much and what a what a warm welcome. Delighted to virtually connect with everybody uh, here in the European Parliament in Strasbourg, where we're, we are, uh, by we, I mean the 705 MEPs representing the 27 member states um, are, are voting on our citizens' behalf. But um, delighted to be a part of this conversation with you, Tim, and uh, and, and, and everybody today. Um, um, uh, for me, as very proud to say uh, Ireland's youngest MEP at 34, um, and my work uh, and my involvement into the political sector over the last number of years. Uh, when I speak to schools through the Blue Schools Programme or the European Ambassador Schools Programme, or even through Erasmus Plus uh, at third level, um, there is uh, always a resounding disconnect uh, I have felt from uh, what has and what does happen here in the parliament and in the institutions and what happens uh, and needs to happen at home. And, and these type of conversations open up the floor. Uh, and dare I say, this year, uh, EU Year of Youth, allows us as policymakers, uh, as those that are really uh, big champions uh, of your uh, youth issues as a whole, who didn't grow up like me in, in politics traditionally, uh, but always involved in the active citizen role in, in, in volunteerism in, in the community I grew up in, the west of Ireland. Um, so this year really breaks down all the barriers and makes an honest conversation uh, and the implementation stage, uh, I think, really, really exciting. Um, for me, um, and just to share in a few short minutes, um, why this year is so important to me is it champions conversation. Uh, and dare I say, it forces us policymakers to close uh, close our mouths a little bit and open our ears a little bit more to making sure our younger people are at the heart of our conversation. Um, and that means not just making and designing policy uh, and frameworks that are going to be impacting them for years to come um, and they not having a seat at the table. Um, and I think this European year is not just about this year, even though this is the anchor, that, that catalyst to change, but what comes after this uh, in terms of implementation, in terms of continuing on the conversation and making sure the next European elections and local elections in 2024 has youth representation uh, either as a candidate or a part of, of the team of, a, of, of somebody who is running on their behalf. And I think that's um, I, I, I think there, there is pressure on this year, but there's a great deal of opportunity impossibility from it also. Um, for me, when when I ran in 2019, one of the biggest conversations are, well, what, what happens over there? And, and, and what are you doing on behalf of my uh, on behalf of me and my community and, and, and my friends? And that came resounding from, from young people from primary school to secondary to third level. Uh, and again, that disconnect, uh, I believe, is going to be facilitated uh, and supported. And I would hope uh, um, broken down uh, in this EU year of youth and not just in Ireland because we have a very high percentage of, of being pro-European but also across the member states so those young people that are traveling on Erasmus plus or seeing Europe as a whole um, are also seeing other champions within the European member states and not traveling from one side of the EU to the other and not feeling uh, the connection that the European Parliament uh, and the European institutions has overall we need action though uh, we need to ensure that this year comes with something and I'm really excited to hear from uh, Harry usually has a good to-do list of all things for policymakers so I'm very excited to hear from him uh, and Lorraine in terms of being our coordinator and our champion for this year on an Irish front uh, to making sure that we are coming away with tangible asks and and demands and meeting those demands and how that looks um, for for me there's a number of great programs like Blue Schools program uh, European Ambassador Schools program see Erasmus plus and I say that for any uh, school goer or teacher or or parent or business that is looking to learn more about the European um, European Union through their household or through their business or through their school. Sometimes we don't know what's on the doorstep, so I always like to champion those projects. And no doubt Lorraine will, will continue on that conversation as well through uh, Solidarity Corps, through in the European Education Area that comes a lot in the committees that Tim, you, you so kindly uh, introduced that I sit on 
like the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, the Culture and Education Committee, and the Liberties and Home Affairs Committee. And in essence, if you're to, to put them all in a bubble, and what do those three committees connect to? It's community, it's opportunity, and it's making sure there's equality and fairness in all. Um, and that covers across, uh, really, it, 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 it is, is the reason why I put my hand up and got off the armchair and got active in, in our political cycle. Um, I'm sure I'm probably very close to my few minutes, so I'll, I'll wrap up and just want to reiterate, uh, Tim, that you so kindly um, opened up and, and shared about me and my passions. Uh, I am a big champion of mental health and well-being. Unfortunately, it's not seen as a competency here in the European Union yet. I think we might need to see one or two treaties changed. But what I'm hoping through the European Year of Youth and the Conference on the Future of Youth, uh, on Future of Europe, I should say, is that mental health and well-being um, and the in, the importance of that at both young young age, those going into uh, third level education, applying for their first job in the journey of lifelong learning and so on and so forth sees the benefits of having mental health a part of our conversation here in a european front unfortunately we do not have a, a, a solid legacy when we when we when it comes to mental health and well-being across the european union it's not just ireland's story but we have an opportunity to change that and i think what the pandemic has uh, dare i be ever so cheeky and say gifted us is the opportunity to see that our citizens are not being supported in their mental health and well-being and uh, we place an awful lot of emphasis and and um and money on the back end so that reactive care and we need to champion preventative care so when you look at Finland um, and you see vul vulnerability language taught at a younger age um, based from a pilot project demanded by a community group you see there's opportunity to change and we need to get on that uh, and on that uh, that that uh, that road of that change um, I also see great opportunity around the gender debate uh, and dialogue. Right now, we have about a 14.1% uh, gender pay gap uh, between male and uh, uh, men and women. That desperately needs to change. Um, and uh, and I'm definitely coming to my end of my few minutes, but um, hopefully questions from the floor will allow me just to reiterate a little bit more about the importance of of, of what I see happens here in the European Union and, and the Parliament as uh, in particular and what I champion across Midlands Northwest as an MEP, but realistically Ireland as a whole, because um, everything that happens here uh, impacts not just the communities in my constituency, but across the European Union. And again, uh, that EU message of young people at the helm of that of that change um, is, is so vitally important now more than ever. Um, and finally to say, uh, on our 50th anniversary of, of signing in and getting involved uh, in, in the big solidarity that is the European Union, um, we need to desperately also understand where we've come from in order to respect where we are, in order to plan for the future. Uh, and I'm really excited the European Year of Youth allows us to look back with great respect uh, and admiration and figure out where do we want to go next as a whole and young people lean that way. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Maria. Um, now I'd like to call on our second speaker. Uh, it's Lorraine Gilligan, and Lorraine is the Executive Director of Leargas. Leargas has been appointed the National Coordinator for the European Year of Youth in Ireland. It's, Leargas is a national agency for EU programmes in education, training and youth. So it supports organisations across Ireland to develop and exchange good practice through programmes including Erasmus Plus and of course the European Solidarity Corps. Lorraine herself has more than 25 years experience working across many fields of European engagements to boost learning and mobility opportunities and has unique insight into the transformational value for participants, for practitioners and for organisations who embark on European programmes. Lorraine, the floor is yours please. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Tim, for the, the warm welcome and uh, lovely introduction. Um, as you said, my, my name is Lorraine Gilligan, and I am the Executive Director for Lurgis. And while many of you may have heard of Erasmus, uh, you may not necessarily associate that with Lurgis, but after today, that might be a little bit different. I'll tell you a little bit about who we are first. Um, so we are a national agency for EU programmes, and for over 35 years now, Lurgis has delivered European exchange programmes in schools, in youth work, in community work, and in vocational education and in adult education. And throughout all of that time, I think we've 
very much been in a privileged position to to witness these exchanges and how they connect people and uh, communities in different countries uh, and really helps to bring a European dimension into the lives and the work of, of people and of organisations across across Ireland really and Europe. Um, we are the national agency in Ireland for Erasmus Plus for the sectors that I mentioned earlier and, the, and that Tim, Tim mentioned also and also for the European Solidarity Corps which supports volunteering in communities around Europe and also for many other EU programmes and initiatives are, are at home with us in, in Lurgis. I like to describe us as a very supportive organization. So while we manage complex programs and we award funding, we're also an organization that supports the development and exchange of European values and ideas. And, and we offer training and insights and coaching and advice and more to those who are involved in or who are considering getting involved in our programs. Um, we help our participants through the entire life cycle of their project. So even though there is bureaucracy involved and systems involved in accessing and delivering these funding, as a national agency, Lurkis is there to help you through all of that. So in 2022, I have to say that all of us in Lurgis are absolutely delighted to be taking the responsibility as the national coordinator for the European Year of Youth. It's a responsibility that we really recognise as being very important for now, but as Maria has said, even more important for the future and for, for, for the environment that we create for our young people in the future at so many different levels of our societies. A European year of youth is a powerful thing um, and, and we see it that the spotlight that, that Tim and, and the, the EU representation are providing today is, is another powerful thing. And I feel like we have a responsibility always really, but I think in particular this year to, to look to work more closely with youth work and with organisations and groups all across Ireland to really help connect young people to the different opportunities and decisions that can change lives in, in, in very many ways. Um, and, and we won't be on our own in that. As, as Maria's reference, this is an EU initiative. We'll be working across Europe with other national coordinators for the European year. And in each country, we've been asked to focus on a couple of priorities for the year. And I'll talk you through those now. Um, the first really is to look at recovering and renewing the positive perspectives for young people, in particular after COVID-19 and all of the different challenges that that's presented and that we know have particularly impacted on, on young people in, in a way very different to the rest of us, I think. Um, but also we want to do that while highlighting how initiatives and policies like the green and digital transitions can offer opportunities for young people and, and for society at a larger level. We also want to focus on supporting young people and this is through including youth work to help them to acquire rele rele relevant knowledge and, and competences as Maria has alluded to in, in terms of helping them to become very active and engaged citizens here but also to be inspired and have a, a feeling of a, a European sense of belonging as part of the year. We want to look to support young people to acquire a better understanding of all of the different opportunities available to them, but also the EU structures and institutions that help to provide those opportunities in partnership with, with national governments. And we want to be able to do those activities at EU level, national level, local level, you know, at, at every scale that we possibly can uh, to help them support their development. And there's a policy element to this as well. So, uh, you know, there are people, there are people and policies out there, uh, like the EU Youth Strategy, the the Department of uh, DSETI here in Ireland, who are involved in developing strategies and policies for young people. And we want to use the year to to focus that spotlight on making sure that a youth perspective is brought into that policy making at all levels. Uh, so they're the main main priorities that that we have to tackle in the year. Um, and we, we really strongly believe that, that young people have, uh, have the rights to express themselves, their ideas and to share their lived experiences. And we know that in the past couple of years that hasn't been very easy for many and opportunities to do that have been very limited. But we also know that at the same time, young people are really making themselves heard on 
big issues like climate and equality and, and mental health and social justice and that's just to name a few uh, they've led a lot of conversations in those areas and it's more than just listening to them it's about thinking about the actions that they see as being important to happen in order to support implementing those views and, and bringing that decision making to life so in the european year of youth we want to shine that spotlight that we're here about today we want to shine it on on all of the spaces and ways that young people can individually and collectively express themselves. We will, through the youth port portal, there'll be a hub of activities under the banner of European Year of Youth to try and help make finding these opportunities and events um, more simple for young people. We want to create new opportunities at grassroots level by having micro grants available for organizations and groups to develop their own projects and initiatives and activities so that they can bring more young people into that spotlight and support them to see just all the different pathways that are there uh, and create new pathways to improve their, their participation. Um, we also want to work with our amazing partners that we've built uh, relationships with over the last 35 years of programs within youth organizations and arts organizations and sports groups and schools and reaching out across all of the different sectors for those who are passionate about the empowerment of young people and, and to work on that shared goal to make sure that more young people can access the information and the different opportunities that they need. And we also want to make sure that we direct that spotlight into the spaces that aren't always seen. And we want to make sure that for a European year of youth, that there is a really strong focus on inclusion and on diversity and that we actively use our, our, our light and our position in the year to seek out young people who feel perhaps not connected or, or not involved or if they feel like all of this is speaking to other people and, and not to them um, we really strongly believe with our partners that they should feel the spotlight and they should have the warmth of those opportunities too and, and the opportunity to share their voices and their experiences so this is all from our work with the EU programs over the years, and, and we really know that doing a youth exchange or you know building a participation project in your in your community with your friends, having the chance to volunteer in another country or or, or here at home, um, or, or taking the opportunity to get that travel pass and go explore and discover EU, we know that they are all tools for personal growth and also for the organisations that work with and support young people in those in those adventures. And we know that the growth that takes place through these activities is really transformational, and that and that it can impact on you know lives, many many lives across Europe and, and in Ireland, and and the decisions that young people are are are, are prepared to make in different ways so so really that's why Lergus and all the different support structures that we work with in terms of making youth work possible here and European youth work possible here that's why we feel it's really important to keep working to connect directly with young people and to help them to benefit from different European opportunities um, I'm probably coming to the end close to the end of my eight minutes but there's just a few last things that I want to say as well and I suppose I do want like Tim, Tim said am I going to sell Lergus a little bit and I, I really want to because I do want to invite you to engage with us in, in all the different ways so if you haven't engaged with us before you want to find out a little bit more about Lergus I, I do want to let you know that you know like many organizations we have a mission statement and, and in Lurgus our mission statement is it's it's for an inclusive Ireland where we can all participate in and enjoy the transformational value of European learning experiences and be supported to to reach our potential and I think that the European year of youth has that potential for 2022 and beyond that um, and that there is potential for a legacy for the year to be very powerful uh, to be a call to action and a call to courage and a call for change and a call for solidarity um, I think that during the year and afterwards we want to help young people to be confident and to feel connected and to feel ready to take their space and to take the opportunities uh, that are there for them to use their voices so so in the end we we want to bring Ireland into the heart of Europe we, we use this phrase a lot and we hear it a lot but we do we want to bring Ireland into the heart of Europe and, and Europe into the heart, heart of Ireland and, and into the hearts of of our young people so I'll finish by just inviting you all if you need to or you want to figure out how you or your organization or your friends might like to do something in the European Year of Youth 
to get in contact with us in Lurgis and we'll be more than happy to to talk to you and help to guide you and maybe link you in with others who are doing something in your community or to help you to do something for for yourselves. So thanks for the opportunity to say all of this today. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm really looking forward to the year and all the exciting things that we'll get to, to share under the umbrella of, of the European Year of Youth. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Lorraine. That's a fascinating menu of actions and activities that you have laid out for us. Um, I think it's going to be a fabulous year and I really appreciate your enthusiasm for, for the whole year. Now I want to present our final speaker, uh, it's Harry McCann, who at the age of 23 is already an award-winning entrepreneur and journalist. So he's currently enrolled in a master's in political communications in DCU. And he was most recently selected by the European Commission and Eurodesk to join the European pool of young journalists. Harry, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Timothy, um, and thank you very much for having me here today. I'm delighted to be involved in, in this great discussion. And I, I think I probably have uh, the joy of going last in the sense that I'm going to reiterate much of what Lorraine and Maria have said. Um, I suppose it's probably one of these rare conversations where I think we're probably all on the same page. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about the year ahead, but I suppose as the, as the I was going to say the young person in the room, I feel as I'm 23 and I know people will laugh at this, I feel like I'm getting older, so I, I don't know how much I speak for young people as much as I did in the past, but I'm going to do my best to, to try and I suppose hit some points and to, to push forward, I suppose, what the importance of the year ahead means for us, but I'm not going to need uh, my full time, so I, I'll be as quick as I can. I suppose as a generation, we're one of the most connected and educated generations in history confidence filled with self-belief that we have real power to influence change um, but I suppose we face a landscape of uncertainty as well um, we're the first generation not to improve in the previous one in terms of wealth income and future prospects and as we hopefully enter into a post-covid period touch wood um, we know the pandemic has disproportionately affected young people forcing many of us to put our lives hopes and dreams on hold the European Year of Youth, though, I believe, presents us with an exciting opportunity um, to listen to what young people have to say, to value our contributions, um, and to build a youth-inclusive future. Um, as a person who proudly identifies as Irish and European, I would consider the opportunities the EU provides us as one of the most significant benefits of our membership. And I know the Commissioner mentioned that at the start of the video, that these opportunities are so important and, and they're really, really valuable. For the European Year of Youth, I believe our focus should be on these opportunities. And I'll just highlight a few um, that stick out to me the most. So the opportunity to reach more young people from diverse backgrounds, um, to educate them about the benefits of the European Union. There's an array of programs and initiatives, and I know that they've been mentioned already in this conversation. But I think we need to make young people aware of those that are available to them, support our freedoms to work, uh, study and, and live anywhere in the EU from Erasmus Plus to Discover EU, the possibilities really are endless. It's also an opportunity to bring young people closer to decision-making. That's something I'm particularly passionate about. Um, as 25% of the European population were too often excluded from the conversation and the political process, left looking on from the outside as policymakers shape the future. Um, the citizens' panels, which are taking place at the moment as a part of the, of the Conference on the Future of Europe, are something that's really sparked an interest for me and, and I, I believe they should remain into the future because participatory democracy needs to be a permanent part of decision making in the EU. Um, we need to engage more citizens in the conversation and work together to build a, a brighter future. The European Year of Youth is also an opportunity to deliver legislation that helps youth. Um, I know Maria has outlined several different key areas for young people along the lines of um, climate change to social inclusion and from housing to the future of work. We do face big challenges now and in the future, and we need our policymakers to work together to introduce legislation and policies that support us as we move forward. And then lastly, I think the opportunity to positively influence young people's perception of politics is a really, really important point. Um, a lot of young people feel left down by politicians, um, and we need to use this year to listen to what young people are telling us and to value contributions. And I suppose I'd, I'd like to finish by, up by saying that I think the youth activism and the rise of youth activism really shows our determination to secure a better and brighter future for us all. Um, and while I have concerns and, and many valid concerns, I believe, I'm also confident about the future. But to make progress, we have to have a multi-stakeholder process. And I suppose the, the, the 
quotes cheesy, but I think it, it, it really aligns with the European project, which is alone, we can do so little, together we can do so much. And that's really what I believe this year needs to be, a collective effort to build a, a brighter future for us all that is inclusive and that really brings everybody into the conversation and shapes a future that I suppose we're all proud of. So look, I, I, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to take up too much time. I, I think I probably got under, so I think I win in terms of the shortest contribution, but hopefully we'll be able to answer some of the questions afterwards. So um, thanks a million. Timothy, I actually think you're just muted there. Sorry, I know that's the most common uh, sentence in any video call these days. Okay, that's cool. Thanks very much, Larry. Okay, no uh, worries. thanks very much. I mean, uh, I th as I say, you are the shortest presenter and the, and the youngest, so chapeau for everything. Huh? So for the audience, we've heard the perspectives from each of the, the three panel members, and now it's your turn, the audience, to give your insight and, and feedback. So as I said earlier, the email address to which to send questions or comments is events at europeanmovement.ie. And that email address is visible now at the, the bottom of the screen. So the first question that I have for the panel is whether or not you consider that the EU adequately takes into consideration what young people need and want when we're developing the policy. So I think maybe we'll ask Harry that question first. So do you believe, Harry, that the EU takes into consideration what young people need and want uh, when developing policy, in particular for, for young people? Um, okay, so I think the fresh young faces who can relate to the issues and problems of young people, so Maria obviously being one of them within the in the, within the Parliament and the Commission, probably are more likely to take into consideration the challenges facing young people. And I think that's been something that you can recognise, but I think we probably have lacked a small bit the, I suppose, full awareness and the full understanding of the real impact that a lot of challenges have had on young people. I, I mentioned the pandemic, and, and I, I come back to this time and time again, which is young people have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. A lot has happened to us in the last two years, and I often think there's a lack of appreciation for that. We, you know, I, I was born in 1998, so, you know, I, 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 through my childhood, I would have experienced the impacts of the financial crisis. We've now come through the pandemic as well. There's been a lot of challenges and we do face more from housing, as I said, to climate change. There's an array of issues. And I suppose there's probably not as much of an appreciation as there should have been in the past. But, but and I, I say but because... I suppose I've been lucky enough in the last couple of weeks and in the last month or so to see, I suppose, the initiative that's been taken for the European Year of Youth so far. And I am particularly confident that this isn't just a tokenistic year that's going to try and hold a bunch of events where we smile and nod and take pictures and say that we care about young people. I actually do believe this is a year that really will focus on the problems facing young people. And I'm particularly excited about that because too often we've had conversations about what we can do and how we can do it, but I really feel we're taking action now. So look, in the past, we haven't done as well as we should have, but in the future, I believe that we're going to do more. And I suppose I'm going to be optimistic and say that the future is excited and I'm excited about it. And I think hopefully Maria and the rest of our colleagues in the parliament and in the commission as well, will take the action necessary to make sure that young people are front and center. And as I said, build a youth inclusive future. That's fantastic, uh, Harry. Thank you very much uh, for those insights and hopefully we can live up to your expectations. Mm -hmm. There's a question from the audience from Alison and I think I'll direct it at you, Maria. The question from Alison who, work, who is a student in UCD is, what is the easiest way for a graduate to get into EU politics? So Maria, can you tell Alison what the easiest way to get into EU politics is? Yeah, fanta uh, fantastic question. And and, and just to add a, a line or two to Harry's great response there, I mean, he says it exactly as it is, and he probably says it a little bit more diplomatic than me in politics would say, you know, I think fundamentally, the, the reason why uh, young people have been left out from the conversation, and they have, um, is because we have forgotten to look at that 25% of the youth population, because in our eyes, um, historically, they don't vote. 
um, and then therefore how, how and where are they making decisions? But what we and what this year is doing is looking at the fact that, hang on a second, we are building those policies uh, for, 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 for them to be our leaders. Um, and many of them are. Um, many of them don't even know they're being called to lead. Um, and that's unfortunate because... Uh, we haven't got it right in generations and and it's the generations coming behind like Harry's um, Harry's age group um, that are going to be carrying the brunt of a lot of decisions being made now um, and um, and if they're not at the decision making table then shame on us um, but it, th th there's too much pressure for them to fix everything um, and and therefore this year uh, and, and it really is the catalyst of change um, he, he says it a little bit more positive than I, but collectively we, we will get there and we share the same enthusiasm in that sense. But back to the question at hand, Alison, I'm not ignoring you. I apologize. I went on my TEDx talk there for a second. Uh, but the easiest way for a graduate to get into the EU politics is no doubt Lorraine can answer this probably better than I. I mean, from an MEP office, it's connecting to MEPs offices, whether it be Irish across the EU. Um, there's a direct link there. Um, it, it depends on what you are looking to graduate in or looking interested in sometimes we have uh be it uh you know lobbyist groups all three institutions um the there's the blue book program that runs every six months in um in both the commission and the council uh and in the parliament here i believe too um i keep, uh we've had a number of trainees usually every six months since uh, i entered into politics that have come through the office and might work specifically on something, uh, be it fundamental human rights or mental health or uh, the, the future of sustainability. And then they come in with their expertise from that. Um, and I also think then, as I said, there's lobbyist groups so that you're specifically working on a core subject. Um, and, and ultimately, when you think of translation, then um, there's some great programs. But Alison, if you want to give me a shout, I'm happy to point you in the right direction. And Lorraine, maybe you might have some um, some some harder facts outside of uh in terms of where to go but there is i cannot stress enough when we join in 73 we have a cohort of people now retiring and we need to fill those seats uh and we need to make sure we have uh people um uh within within the the corridors and hallways and decision makings not just politics but the workers um to making sure the irish voice is still represented within the european bubble so um it's incredibly important that that uh graduates like yourself are coming into the to the eu as a whole yeah, thanks very much, Maria. Uh, I mean, Maria covered sort of the political side of things and how to get in to be a representative uh, in the EU. Um, I might just say that the Department of Foreign Affairs are very much pushing uh, the idea of getting people to work within the, the institutions like the Commission, my institution, or the Parliament, or any of the other institutions. Uh, and you'll find all the information on the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs website at eujobs.ie. Uh, uh, but maybe Lorraine might want to add to that uh, as well. Lorraine, uh, do you want to add to anything about getting involved in politics or getting involved in the EU itself? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think I think what I can add to, to what Maria has already said about the different, I suppose, stage and internships and, and things like that that are, are generally available within the institutions, you can you can get in contact and we'll try and help you to, to find information on those. But but I, I think that for young people, I think one of the founding corners of um, whether it becomes politics or activism or, or sharing ideas, it, it's about trying to find the ways to put yourselves into different conversations and in different rooms. And, you know, the programs that we run here in Lurgis with schools or colleges or uh, youth organizations and volunteering organizations, that, that's what they do all the time is to try and create opportunities for young people to experience other cultures, different opinions, the same things in a different environment and learning all of the things that we have in common. You know, Harry, Harry's kind of referenced it in terms of his experiences at EU level that, you know, the more you get out and talk into into different rooms and with different spaces, the differences fall away and, and we, we develop a common language and a common understanding. And I think I think that kind of empathy 
in my opinion and I think in terms of what we try and do with our with our programs um, I think that's a really strong tool for any young person who's considering a career or a future of representing other people and, and supporting other people to have a better a better society so so I would say um, you know get in touch with us or your your college or if you're part of an organization and, and see if there are any um, you know opportunities for you to get involved in EU programs I know um, you know the, the National Youth Council of Ireland have a, a program called Young Voices and it's an extremely diverse group of young people who who are part of an EU structured dialogue I think you, you, you called it the, the youth dialogue process um, that that creates a, a trajectory for issues to be discussed at a very local level right into the EU presidency of the moment and the different youth goals and EU youth policy that becomes part of it so so for me I think it's about trying to find um, different spaces and conversations to have come to, to, to engage with other people on and and create that empathy um, and and then I think the systems bit is, is already fairly well established as Maria can tell you um, you know in terms of you know finding the opportunity to bring bring that voice bring that experience bring your thinking and your expertise into into the decision maker space but but getting involved in the conversations I think is a really good starting point for anyone I feel who, who might want to go down that road. Yeah, thanks for that good advice, uh, Lorraine. I have a question from the audience, which I think I'll put to all three of you in turn. And the question is, what actions can be taken so that the European Year of Youth is a year of meaningful engagement with, with young people? And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with Harry on this one. Harry, I'd just like to know what your expectations for the year might be. What do you think meaningful engagement would be? Yeah, I think... Meaningful engagement, I think I mentioned it there, it, it, it's about listening, first of all, I think it's very important, I think having as many opportunities for young people to share their vision and their voice with those in power, um, but then I also think it's, it's the action that follows from that as well, you know, I've, I've on many occasions been at talking shops where, you know, we speak for a full day, we come up with some great ideas and great proposals and then nothing really happens with them. Um, I mentioned the citizens panels as part of the, the conference on the future of Europe, and I'm really interested by them because I know there's been a collective agreement amongst all the, the council, the parliament and the commission in terms of what's going to happen after that. And they're very similar where everyone comes, they put together their proposals and then they're brought to plenaries where those in power actually discuss them and, and try to put through the ideas that they think are viable and could be possible, possibly a part of the future of Europe. And I believe that's kind of what we need here is which young people are involved in those conversations. They're a representation of all of the, the, the 27 nations. But I think what we need to do is to really make sure that that's what's happening is that there's young people are giving the opportunity to not only share their voice, but then real action is taken from that. And there's a clear and defined process there. And um, I know that Lurgas and, and through I'm an ambassador for Eurodesk here in Ireland as well. And I know through the European pool of young journalists, there is a lot of initiatives and different programs taking place this year that really are giving young people opportunities to get involved at a European level and it does seem as I said those really are going to be promising and successful initiatives and programs that aren't just done because they feel they have to be done but because those in power want it to be done so look I don't think there's anything in particular or specific that I can say we absolutely need to do this but I think we need to be engaging as much as possible as often as possible with young people and really valuing those contributions mm -hmm. because I can tell you if I sit in another conversation with somebody and they take down notes and nothing happens with those notes again I might just scream <laughs> and look and I don't I don't point <laughs> fingers at anyone in particular but I just it, we really just really make sure that there's a follow-through process here and that's what this year could be but this year is only one year as well you need to make sure that this continues for many, many years to come and that a youth inclusive future is a core part of the European project moving forward. So it's, look, this year is only a starting point. This needs to be a very, very long term project. OK, thanks. Thanks, Harry. And Lorraine, I think you also, in your introduction remarks, pointed to the legacy of the year and what you expected from it. But I think really this is sort of a question for you as well. I mean, come to, to Marie in, in, in a little while. So can you tell us like what actions you're actually going to take uh, to ensure that the European Year of Youth uh, is meaningful and the engage engagement is meaningful for young people? Yeah, I, I I won't repeat what Harry says because I, I do think I do agree with him a hundred percent in ter in terms of um you know we we want to see actions uh, resulting from the different interventions that we have over the year and I think that's why 
one of the major focuses that we will have is to try and work really, really closely with uh, organizations on the ground and communities and schools who who have the relationship with young people um, and who can continue the conversations and who can also help the young people to bring their thinking forward because it's it's hard to walk into a room and answer questions about the climate and social justice and have the answers to mental health it's a process young people have to be brought through conversations and um, there are there's 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 many many years of experienced uh, you know youth organizations and teachers and schools and colleges and, and volunteering organizations who, who who make this their business this is what they do they build these relationships with young people and, and we want to really work with that approach we want to make sure that for the year this year we get into more of those organizations and that we give them easier access to opportunities and information that they might normally find in eu programs so that so that then after the year the programs are more accessible for them that the connections are made and uh, the confidence is built um there's a there's a focus to the conversation that happens with young people and it makes it easier for them to understand how to support young people in achieving outcomes from those those kinds of engagements and projects and activities or whatever else it might be but that they that they want to do so so i really feel that's going to be um you know a key tool for us for the year is we're not sitting here thinking that we're trying to bring something new and shiny to the table we know that there are so many different people who in every day of their lives in their work and in their free time and spare time this is what they want to do this is how they work this is how they're engaging with young people and we we really want to just connect with them and give them that little bit of a, lever a leverage really for the year to say uh, and to have access maybe to people like Maria and people who are thinking about making decisions on policy and opportunities that there are things that they might like to know about what when when they're doing that work and, and making sure that you know I think your your words were a youth inclusive future Harry I think I think that's going to be a statement for the year how do we create more of that what do we need to do just to make that part of the conversation first you know Okay, thanks very much, Lorraine. And I'd just like to pop the same question at, at Maria. So Maria, what actions do you think uh, could be taken so that the engagement is meaningful for young people for this European Year of Youth? Yeah, absolutely. And collecting from Lorraine and Harry's points, I mean, first and foremost, I think we need to build trust. And that was really echoed um, from Harry um, that there is a lack of trust in policymakers, and not just in Ireland, but across the European Union, um, and that needs to change. Um, and it can only change through honest and open engagement. Um, and and like I said at the start, we need to, uh, as policymakers, myself included, needs to uh, perhaps close the, the the mouth a little and open the ears a lot more in order to to really build that trust. Um, co a couple of concrete steps, though, I can see. Um, is um, best practices across the EU. So coming out of the EU year, what are we actually learning? Uh, what are we seeing? Um, because while there might not be all legislative changes or funding attached to that change, but there is best practices. Um, and that's something that we can, um, from youth groups um, and Lorraine shared there, you know, if there's a cohort of, of people trying to push young people on the podium, then we need to know how they're doing it so other people can can build within their own networks at, at, at their own member state level. Um, I'm a big uh, champion for what Harry had shared uh, and and really what Lorraine ha had, has also shared too in citizens engagement. So I know what was proposed in the culture and education EU year resolution was that we would open committees here in the parliament to make sure younger people are also coming into the floor and asking questions. So they're in charge and also in direct support of of the content that we're putting in on their behalf uh, and growing from that. Um, if utopia was was a thing, um, I think on an Irish front, and we have time to do it. Um, in 2024, a percentage, be it as a pilot project, a percentage of seats at local level dedicated to under 25 year olds um, or under 30 year olds, ideally under 25, so that we can see younger people coming through the floor uh, and coming coming with ideas to the floor, I should say, and coming to the floor, um, a part of a campaign system. Uh, and therefore we we open up and we have great appetite to, to what that change is. And I think that would really 
dare I say, put a lot of us um, out of sorts and break the status quo, which needs breaking. Uh, and I think we could we could really make that work inside the next two and a half years. That's a, that's a call I hope that will come from the EU year of, of youth. Um, for me as a champion of mental health and all the conversations we've had at even at the, um, the European Youth event here held um, in October here in Strasbourg that will be held again this year. Um, you know, if mental health is a priority, perhaps one or two on the list, um, um, then it needs to be a priority on, on the policymakers now. Um, and for me, an, an extension of this year would be an EU year dedicated to mental health and well-being. Um, and therefore, that continuation of how we build and talk about policies would be really, really impactful. And that's something I've, I've been calling on for, for quite a while. And hopefully 2023 is, is, is shaping up. Uh, the president of the commission stole my 2022 year. So I'll, I'll pivot and, and, and so kindly go to the 2023 year uh, after her. Um, and then, and then I must say too, I, I believe in some schools it's a pilot project. The European uh, EU studies um, and politics, you know, politics and society as a whole. And I'd like to see that if it's not rolled out across all all uh, all schools and in, in uh, secondary schools across the country, I think that is again a fundamental piece, as Lorraine shared, um, a fundamental piece of change. It's not going to happen overnight, but it certainly lends to a good, a, a better conversation, and will break that. Uh, Dare I say again, the legacy um, that is if you were if you did not grow up in politics, then getting to the table of change is incredibly difficult. Uh, and one thing I often talk about is I didn't grow up in politics and I'm very proud of that in many ways because it has changed my way of thinking in some. I grew up in community. That was my politics. Um, and we need to ensure that our community reflects our politics and vice versa. And if we don't break down those barriers um, and get get the political acumen thinking about it in a different way, um, then we'll never have gender balance. We'll never have minorities feeling respected uh, and highlighted within here. Uh, we'll never get rid of the term minority if that doesn't happen. Uh, and when we discuss and debate issues here on the floor in, in Strasbourg and Brussels, we're always going to feel that disconnect to those at home. And that that is what fundamentally, I believe, is the concrete steps coming out of the EU year of youth. Yeah, thanks very much, Maria. And actually linking up with a lot of what you said there in your last reply is a question from Michael from Shanola. And Michael wants to know is what could be done to promote the EU in young people's daily lives whilst going to school? And I guess, Harry, you're the person closest to school. So what do you think uh, could be done to promote uh, the EU and people's lives? Yeah, I think I think generally we need to have a little bit more political education in our in our classrooms and in our schools. Um, and I think there's been a lot of conversation about this recently. Because I know uh, Minister Byrne had mentioned about the, and a few others have been pushing for this idea of pushing European education within our schools. Because I don't think we hear about it often enough. As I said, I often think the greatest benefit of our membership is the opportunities it provides us. Um, there's some fundamentals, as I said, that the right to live, study and work anywhere within the EU and that they're obviously core. But I think day to day, the impact the EU has on our lives is important. And like our support for the EU is very strong. You know, we all support our EU membership. You know, there, there's no doubt about that. But I think from a younger age, I think we need to entice more young people to become politically active and involved and to introduce more programs and initiatives into our schools and encourage that because as i said we, we can't if we, if we continue to do what we've always done we can't expect any form of change we can't expect any form of progress so if we want more fresh faces with new ideas in our decision making seats then we're going to need to make sure that young people are engaged and active citizens which i believe look i believe actually a lot of young people are and i think you know the fridays for futures and other campaigns have shown that but in terms of really trying to get young people involved from a younger age and, and to really understand the benefits of the EU, I think that's great, is, is trying to introduce more education in. I think it does become abundantly clear as you move out of school um, and into university, the opportunities there with Erasmus. Um, I was involved as well in the, the European uh, Universities Alliance at uh, UCC for my undergraduate. And I know they're developing universities now where you know, you're going to be able to do part of your degree here um, in Cork, let's say, and then do your other part in Liège, and then maybe head over somewhere else across Europe to finish the third or fourth part. And I think that's an exciting opportunity. So I think what I'll probably find is that the minute you move out of school, you really quickly learn and see that there's so many opportunities there that they provide you as a young person. But I just think we need to move back a step and go, OK, 
okay, what can we do in schools to make sure that you understand this and take full advantage of the opportunities, whether it's going into railing in your sixth year or whatever it might be. So yeah, look, I think we need to introduce more programs to make it more an integral part of our education system for certain. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Um, maybe I turn to Lorraine now and ask you the same question, Lorraine. What do you think can be done to promote the EU in uh, young people's lives when, when they're going to school? I'm so happy that you came to me with that question because um, it's one of those things that probably people don't always realize that Erasmus is there also for schools. Um, so schools have access to Erasmus for their staff to do uh, job shadowing or courses or you know different activities for the staff to be able to broaden their horizons and bring in good practices into the day-to-day -day life of schools and um, also potential for classes to go on exchange themselves and to develop all kinds of projects so we, we have a, we you know in the last three years we've seen over 120 percent increase in schools getting involved in Erasmus for schools which is really really good news and I know that we'd be very happy to to talk to anybody up in Donegal and Stranorla about how they might like to get involved in in schools in Erasmus and talk to the teachers and the young people in the school up there that's no problem and the other thing that we can do um already that exists this is a thing called eTwinning. Um, and, and what that is, is a virtual platform for teachers and educators all across Europe to develop connections and to do virtual projects with each other. So we have so many different schools across Ireland and Europe who every day log on to their eTwinning and talk to their partner in Greece or Finland and the classes will exchange on projects and they do amazing uh, pieces of work with each other. So I would say um, if you don't see your, an EU in your school every day, there's definitely ways that that can be done and it can be done really simply. Um, and I would just encourage Michael and maybe his favourite teacher, if, if there's one in the school, uh, to give us a call and we'd be happy to help explain that. Sorry, that's my dog sneezed in the background just as I was finishing up. It's very naughty. Apologies. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks very much, Lorraine. Uh, Maria, I'm afraid Harry and Lorraine have said so much stuff there that maybe there's not much left for you to say, but what do you think uh, should be done to promote the EU in young people's lives? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing more to add there other than delighted to see uh, uh, Stranola. Uh, county Donegal is a very, very strong pro-EU uh, county and Stranola in particular, the school up there in St. Columbus is um, is a fantastic advocate for for the conversation around uh, around the European Union um, and to to both Lorraine and Harry's points I think uh, for long enough we've looked at the EU symbol um, on buildings or on roads and while we're saying yay for EU fund money we have to also understand that we are now contributors to that pod um, and then within that the values that we as a, as a culture and a society from young and old uh, gift into the European Union too and vice versa versa. Um, and I think to, to what I shared earlier and what Harry and Lorraine had added, um, there is so much out there um, um, and how we, there's a European direct library in Letterkenny that does great events in terms of conversations around the European Union, as Lorraine shared, you know, good online and in-person practices, having an MEP come out and visit, um, delighted to go to, to Donegal again. Um, and you know, looking at EU politics in business, uh, in in this in the the senior cycle of of school, uh, perhaps upgrading the CSP in terms of politics and so society that I mentioned earlier, um, and really, I guess when those questions I always and I it hadn't really come up yet is just making sure our information that we're gathering and getting. Uh, and to Lorraine's point earlier, you know, having that conversation at a younger age allows us to be thought processors um, and come in with our own ideas and, and and really see what works and what doesn't work and add value to conversations and take value from conversations. Um, I get a little bit uh, um, uh, sometimes frustrated and sometimes uh, curious as to the wealth of disinformation that's out there, particularly on, in politics. Um, and you see that rise uh, on the on the Eastern Bloc of the European Union. So with that, I think having at, at those conversations at a younger age, um, promoting the EU and all its all its values and where it needs to go and how we drive that forward change. Um, has to happen in person and not just online through through social media platforms and then you see begin to really see great conversation uh and an accountable conversation 
Okay, thanks very much, Maria. We're coming close to the end now, and I'd like each of you in turn, just maybe in one or two sentences only, to tell me what you would like to come out of out of the European year. So maybe we start with Harry. Harry, what would you like to come out of this year? Oh, okay, I'm going to be very, um, I suppose, I, I suppose what I'd say is that Archimedes says, if you give me a place to stand and leave her long enough, I can move the world. And I think this is what this year is, a place to stand for young people and a lever to shift and change how we make decisions in Europe. And we can absolutely be a, an opportunity to shape a bright and, and I suppose prosperous future for the EU. But we need to make sure that young people are front and centre. And as I said, we develop a youth inclusive future. That's me, done and dusted. Two sentences, give or take. What a lovely idea. Uh, Lorraine, in one or two sentences, uh, what would you like to see come out of this year? Well, I can't follow that, Harry. That's that's left my mind just uh, whirling there um, with with so, so much uh, feeling, I suppose, and, and just inspiration. I think Lurgis and, and in our role and, and as a national coordinator, we want to create the space for for young people. We want to we want to have that space cleared shine that spotlight on young people and allow the things that come from them uh, to be to be communicated to different decision makers and back into Europe. That's ultimately what we want. We don't have any preset agenda. It's it's literally to see what comes and create the space for, for what comes. Super. And the last word to Maria, please. Uh, coming out of this year, uh, a stronger mental health package uh, and an EU strategy across uh, across our 27 member states and an EU year of good mental health to make sure that conversation continues. Um, uh, success to me will have in 2024 at local and national and European level youth, youth uh, representatives uh, trying to get involved in the political landscape and not just as candidates, but also as, uh, as support teams. Uh, and I think that's where when you cannot, when you don't see it, you cannot be it. Uh, and that is fundamental change when we talk about the EU year of youth. Listen, that's that's fantastic. Uh, thank you, the three of you, sincerely uh, for your presentations and for answering all of the questions that came to you uh, so comprehensively. Uh, I want to take this opportunity as well to thank uh, the European Movement for assisting us in making the event uh, a reality. And finally, a few of the audience, I hope you enjoyed the event and I hope you found it useful. I would strongly encourage young people to engage, to participate, and even involve their friends in this European Year of Youth share their knowledge, their experience, and then reach out to those who are less active, especially to those who have fewer opportunities. And that's what the European Year is all about. I wish everybody a very nice afternoon. Bye-bye.